This video will discuss second order spectra in NMR and what happens when our coupling constants aren't much greater than the separation between two coupled peaks. Okay, so we said in the video on first order spectra and on spin spin coupling that the first order perturbation theory that we used in those videos is not valid when the difference in frequency between two peaks on an NMR spectrum, which will be the frequency of the spectrometer times the difference in their uh, magnetic shielding constants, is approximately equal to the coupling constant. So when they're on the same order of magnitude or not greater than, say, a factor of 10. So this could be shown in an example like the following, where we have, let's see, this would be, I suppose, 112 bromo, 112 tribromo, 2 iodo ethane, where we have two different protons. They're not chemically equivalent, so they will couple to one another. But the amount, uh, the chemical shielding, or sorry, the magnetic shielding constant of this proton is probably not the different than this one because the only difference is we've replaced a bromine with an iodine and that probably doesn't affect things too much to where they're that different. So in that case, you might have the following situation where the two peaks aren't very far apart relative to what their coupling constant is. So instead of the first order perturbation theory that we used in those videos, we need to use the linear variational method instead. So our Hamiltonian is still the same. We still have a magnetic Hamiltonian, which is the negative magnetogyric ratio of the proton, the H1 nucleus, times the magnetic field that the spectrometer produces, times the quantity, 1 minus the shielding constant of nucleus 1, times the angular momentum, so the nuclear spin angular momentum operator in the z direction acting on nucleus 1, plus 1 minus shielding constant of nucleus 2 times the z component of the nuclear spin angular momentum operator acting on nucleus 2, plus the coupling term, Planck's constant times the coupling constant divided by h bar squared times the dot product of the nuclear spin angular momentum operator applied to nucleus 1 and applied to nucleus 2. So what we do in the linear variational method is we build a basis set, so all of our trial functions, and here those are going to be the spin up, spin up, spin up, spin down, spin down, spin up, and spin down, spin down functions for nucleus 1 and nucleus 2. So each of our wave functions is going to be a linear combination of each of these. And then we use the secular determinant method as described in the linear variational method video in order to solve for the four energies that we get from these four basis functions in our uh, four wave functions that will result. Okay, and I'm not going to go through the details of what that involves. Um, I'd refer you to the linear variational method video for more details. But basically, we can define some quantities here. Uh, we'll have d sub i, which will be 1 half h nu naught, nu naught being the frequency of the spectrometer, times 1 minus sigma i. And so this is the shielding constant of either nucleus 1 or nucleus 2. And then the function f, which is 1 fourth h times j12. So the, Hamilton, the diagonal matrix elements are minus d1 minus d2 plus f minus d1 plus d2 minus f, uh, let's see, h33, d1 minus d2 minus f, and d1 plus d2 plus f. The cases where the spins are aligned, either both spin up or both spin down, we have uh, the coupling results in an increase in energy, and where the spins are mixed, the coupling results in a decrease in energy. Otherwise, it's just the whether or not each of them is going to be spin up or spin down, which determines the other values. Okay, then the only other uh, factor that's going to be bringing up uh, this case for further is that for H23 and H32 in our Hamiltonian matrix, each of those is going to be coupled 
with our coupling constant, the 1 uh, H times J12. And all the other elements in the Hamiltonian matrix are going to be equal to 0. All right, so when we solve this mess for what our final energy levels are going to be equal to, what you get is that the E1, the lowest energy state, is the same as the value from first order perturbation theory. It's minus h nu naught times 1 minus 1 half times the quantity sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus 1 fourth hj12. E4, the highest energy case, is the same as well, which is just both spin down, just as this was both spin up, plus pretty much the same value inside of here, and then plus 1 fourth uh, hj12 as well. The difference is now that in the two states they were mixing with one another depending on the value of the coupling constant, and now it depends on the relative magnitudes of the difference in frequency between the two different states and the coupling constants between them. So if the frequency difference is large relative to the coupling constant, then this term just becomes, once we take the square root, just becomes nu naught times sigma 1 minus sigma 2. So in the case where this value is much, much larger than the coupling constant, then it just becomes the square root of this term, and everything uh, that follows from first order perturbation theory results. So now, when they're not, uh, when this is not much, much greater than the coupling constant, the coupling constant and this term mix to determine how far those energy levels are going to be split from one another and how they're going to behave. Okay, so this results in the, in the following kind of behavior, that when the coupling constant is zero, you get just the one peak. They're not coupled to one another. Whenever you have, it, whenever the value is one half relative to J12, their separation is half of their coupling constant. You get this type of uh, quartet looking type peak. And then as the separation gets greater and greater, you start looking more and more like a traditional doublet that we would observe from first order perturbation theory. So it gets to the point where whenever this value is say 10 to 15 times greater, it starts to overwhelm the coupling constant and become the sole term that matters in the energies, giving us a more equal and opposite uh, splitting between these two peaks. So this is the second order spectra where we're using uh, first order perturbation theory is not valid. We're using the linear variational method instead and the resulting energies show that the coupling constant now mixes with the difference in frequency between our two protons and doesn't, doesn't reduce to the first order expression until that value is uh, much, much greater, at least a factor of say 10, 15, or 20.